Lady, my boy, that frown on your face tells me you've got a question. What's up? Uh, it's that new Holly four-barrel carburetor, Chad, the one on the Dodge. I can't seem to smooth out the idle. Holy cow, Brady. I plum forgot about you and that carburetor, and I'm sorry. I was planning to brief you on it because it's one of our newest engine features. Let's mosey over and take care of that now. Maybe one reason you couldn't smooth out the idle is you couldn't find the bypass idle airspeed adjusting screw. It has the same effect on idle that you get by adjusting the idle speed adjusting screw on other carburetors. You win the cigar, Chad. Now, whereabouts is that airspeed screw? Here it is, Brady, down inside the air cleaner stud hole. You'd better use a narrow blade screwdriver to adjust it so as you won't damage the stud threads. I see what you mean, Tech. How does this screw control idle speed? It regulates the amount of air admitted to the combustion chambers at idle speed. The fuel-air mixture is controlled by the idle adjusting needle. When the mixture leaves the idle discharge port on its way to the combustion chamber, air from the airspeed port joins the fuel-air mixture. A large amount of air will lean out the mixture by the time it reaches the combustion chamber and tends to increase idle speed. On the other hand, a small amount of air means a richer mixture in the combustion chamber and a slower idle speed. I get it. And when you adjust that airspeed screw, remember that turning it in reduces the amount of air. Turning the screw out lets more air in. But let's back up a minute. Suppose we start all over and get you acquainted with the whole carburetor. Then you'll find it easier to service whenever it needs attention. I'll go for that, Chad. It's a new one on me, so fire away. Good. You'll find this Holly four-barrel carburetor used only on the Dodge 383 cubic inch engines as of now. Like all four-barrel jobs, it's basically two dual downdraft carburetors mounted side by side. Its principal parts are a primary fuel bowl and float assembly, a primary metering body, and a main body. Also, there's a secondary fuel bowl and float assembly with a secondary metering body located under the bowl and finally, the throttle body. A single choke valve is used, and it's in the air horn on the primary side. The choke is the well type, pretty much like the ones you're familiar with, except for some minor differences in linkage. I think I can figure out that choke all right. I agree. Now, the fuel enters through a single inlet fitting in the primary fuel bowl. A horizontal fuel tube feeds fuel to the secondary system. A balance tube between both fuel bowls equalizes air pressure within the bowls. How about telling Brady about the different flow systems? That's a good suggestion, Tech. There are eight different flow systems in this Holly carburetor. There's a primary fuel inlet system, the primary idle system, the idle bypass system, and the secondary idle system. Besides that, there's a primary main metering system a secondary main metering system, a power enrichment system, and the accelerating pump system. Boy, I hope I can remember all eight. You'll find it easier than you think. Take the primary fuel inlet system. All fuel passes through a filter screen into the inlet valve and fills up both the primary and secondary fuel bowls. How much fuel enters the bowl depends on the space between the top of the valve and the seat and on fuel pump pressure. Valve movement is controlled by a float and lever assembly. A coil-shaped spring under the lever helps keep the float in a stable position. A baffle around the valve and seat breaks up any tendency of the fuel to foam. Both bowls have fixed outside vents, and the primary bowl has a mechanical vent that is adjustable. Now that mechanical vent releases excessive vapors that curb idle, or when the engine is stopped. This reduces the possibility of percolation and hard starting when hot. That float level is adjustable, isn't it? It sure is, and it takes less time. You can adjust fuel level on this carburetor while the engine's running. Fuel pump pressure, remember, has a bearing on the proper level. You can also remove inlet valve and seat assemblies in both bowls without removing the carburetor from the engine. These assemblies are vertically positioned in the top side of both bowls. Another time saver. Not bad. Yep. 
a good feature. Now, let's talk about the primary idle system, which functions during idle and low speeds. Airflow at that time isn't strong enough to pull fuel through the primary barrel venturi. But manifold vacuum is high because of the closed or nearly closed throttle valves and provides a pressure differential that operates the idle system. Is that idle system the same on both primary barrels? That's right. So we'll describe just the one side. At idle, normal air pressure causes fuel to flow from the bowl through the main jet into a small angular passage called an idle feed. From this idle feed, fuel flows up a vertical passage called the idle well and passes an idle feed restriction. It then passes into a horizontal passage where it mixes with air from the idle air bleed. This mixture then flows down another vertical passage. At the bottom, the mixture branches off two ways, through the idle discharge passage and through the idle transfer passage. Fuel mixture in the idle discharge passage is controlled by an idle adjusting needle in each side of the primary metering body. Turning it in leans out the mixture. Turning it out makes it richer. From the idle adjusting needle chamber, the mixture goes through main and throttle body passages and is discharged below the throttle valve. Uh, how about that idle transfer passage? Well, as the throttle valve opens slightly, fuel flows through the idle transfer passage from the metering body into the main body and throttle body passages. Then, as the idle transfer slot in the throttle body is exposed to vacuum, fuel mixture is discharged into the throttle bore. As the throttle is opened still wider, increased vacuum in the venturi brings the main metering system into action to smooth out the change from idle to cruising speeds. Now, another system that's new is the idle bypass system. This operates during curb idle speed and is adjusted by that screw down inside the air cleaner stud hole. The bypass system helps prevent stalling due to icing before the engine's warmed up. Fuel enters below the throttle valves even though they're closed completely at curb idle. Say, how does the air get in there to pull fuel from the bypass system? It enters through a port between the primary venturis, Brady. Takes right, and that air flows past the curb idle airspeed adjusting screw. From there, it goes down through the throttle body to a cross groove. Air flows through that cross groove at the bottom of all four barrels at the same time. From there on, it mixes with the idle fuel-air mixture on its way to the combustion chambers. Follow that? Yep, very clear. Good. Now let's talk about the secondary idle system. This system operates during idle and low speeds when the secondary throttle valves are closed. There are no idle fuel adjustments for the secondary barrels. Instead, passages of a predetermined size control the flow of fuel. With the secondary throttle valves closed, fuel flows through main metering restrictions, which are used in place of jets. Fuel goes up a diagonal passage and through the idle restriction. It then flows past the idle air bleed, picks up air, and flows down a vertical passage. At the lower end, the fuel-air mixture flows through the main body and into the throttle body. It is discharged below the throttle valve from the idle discharge port. Clear enough, Chad. Now, uh, what's the next flow system? The primary main metering system, Brady, which operates at cruising speed. The difference between vacuum in the booster venturi and air pressure in the fuel bowl causes fuel to flow through the main metering system. Fuel from the bowl flows through the main metering jet and into the bottom of the main well. It then moves up the well past the main well air bleed. Filtered air from the bleed mixes with the fuel. As the mixture moves up the main well, it passes into a short passage to the main body, then through the horizontal channel of the discharge nozzle. The fuel-air mixture, as you can see, responds quickly to changes in Venturi vacuum 
and vaporizes readily when discharged into the airstream. The throttle valve, of course, controls the amount of mixture drawn into the manifold and regulates engine speed and power output as demanded by the accelerator pedal. a boy, Chad. Now, let me make a short announcement. Hmm? Please turn this record over so we can cover some other flow systems on the Holly carburetor. We've still got the secondary main metering, the power enrichment, and the accelerating pump systems to talk about. Now, the secondary main metering system starts to operate when the secondary throttle valves start to open. This occurs at about three quarters rotation of the primary throttle shaft toward full throttle position. Oh, then it works at three quarters to wide open throttle operation. That's right, Brady. So you can't pin it down to any particular speed. I understand, Tech. Now, is there anything special about the way fuel flows in that system? Well, fuel enters the secondary metering body through the main metering restriction. As it moves up a vertical passage, it mixes with air from the main well air bleed. From there, it moves into the discharge nozzle. It is then discharged into the booster venturi and airstream. Clear enough, Chad. What's next? The power enrichment system, Brady. It provides a richer mixture when the engine is under heavy load and manifold vacuum is low. This is a mixture richer than that needed at cruising speed. You see, Brady, it works a lot like the power bypass jet and step-up rod arrangements you've seen on other carburetors. That's right, Tech. Now, the power system is controlled by manifold vacuum. Vacuum operating through a passage in the main body acts on a diaphragm-type power valve. During idle and normal load operation, vacuum is strong enough to hold the valve closed. But when engine load increases and vacuum drops, a power valve spring opens the power valve. This lets additional fuel flow into the main metering body to enrich the system. I get it, Chad. I see now what tech meant. I'm glad you got that. Now, let's consider the accelerating pump system. It supplies an extra charge of fuel in response to an immediate throttle opening on acceleration. But on this carburetor, the accelerating pump is a diaphragm type, located on the bottom of the primary fuel bowl. It works when the pump operating lever is actuated by throttle movement. As the throttle opens, pump linkage actuated by a cam on the primary throttle shaft forces the pump diaphragm up against spring pressure. Diaphragm pressure forces a pump inlet check ball on its seat to keep fuel from going back to the bowl and sends the fuel instead into a long diagonal passage. From there, it goes into the pump discharge chamber, past a pump discharge needle valve, and out into the venturi. When the throttle closes, returning the linkage to its original position, the spring pushes the diaphragm back down. That lets the inlet check ball drop off its seat and reloads the chamber with fuel ready for the next shot. That a boy, Chad. That gives Brady a good idea of how fuel flows in the various systems. Suppose we get him up to date on adjustments. Exactly what I had in mind, Tech. And I think Brady is going to be pleasantly surprised. Usually, only three external adjustments are needed on this carburetor. They are the fuel level, idle mixture, and the idle airspeed adjustments. All of them are made with the engine running and the tachometer connected. To make the fuel level adjustment, first put a rag under the primary bowl. It will catch fuel that might spill out if the level is too high. Then, remove the sight plug. Now, with a wrench and screwdriver, loosen the lock screw. Then, turn the adjusting nut up or down slightly until fuel just trickles out. Hold the nut and tighten the lock screw. Reinstall the plug and tighten it securely. You adjust fuel level in the secondary bowl the same way. I see, Chad. Now, how do you adjust idle mixture? Before adjusting idle mixture, be sure the engine is up to normal operating temperature. When the choke valve is wide open, Turn both idle fuel adjusting needles in the primary metering body 
until they seat very lightly. Then turn them back out one full turn. Is that sort of a temporary setting? That's the idea, Brady. Then you'll have to adjust them individually for the smoothest idle setting. Now, here's how you adjust that idle airspeed screw we located for you. With a narrow blade screwdriver, you turn it in or out as needed to get an idle speed of 500 RPM. On cars equipped with air conditioning, by the way, the compressor should be on. I see, Chad. And a smooth 500 is what we want. Right. And when you get the idle speed right, readjust the idle fuel adjusting needles to smooth out the performance. You may have to reset idle if it changes when you adjust the mixture. Very clear, Chad. Now, aren't there other carburetor adjustments? Yeah, but you generally make them only when the carburetor is removed for reconditioning. There's a bowl vent clearance and a pump lever clearance that should be examined and adjusted if necessary. Besides these, there's the choke lever position, the choke unloader adjustment, and the fast idle adjustment that should be set. But since those are mainly bench jobs, you'll find a complete how-to-do-it story on each one in this reference book. I see what you mean, Chad. Yep, this book's got the information I'm going to need. That's right. Now, what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes are some troubleshooting tips you might keep in mind. Take a case of hard starting, for instance. Assuming all other factors are all right, that could be caused by an incorrect fuel level or improper choke action. What kind of choke trouble? Oh, the vacuum piston might stick due to dirt or gum and need cleaning. The choke lever might not let the choke close properly. So the fast idle cam lever would need adjusting, or the unloader might not be properly adjusted. I see. Anything else cause hard starting? Yes. The inlet valve and seat might not hold pressure due to wear and need replacement. Bowl vents might be clogged. The inlet screen might be plugged. Or the accelerator pump diaphragm might be ruptured. You'd need to inspect those possibilities and rule out what doesn't apply. Now, if there's poor idle or a poor transition from idle to high-speed operation, like a stumble or hesitation, inspect the primary idle system and the accelerating pump system. The idle airspeed screw and the pump might need adjustment. In addition, the idle passages in the primary metering and main bodies might need cleaning with solvent. Then you'd use compressed air to blow them dry. Yeah, and don't you ever use wire or anything else on those passages. That can ruin them, but good. Okay, Tech. I don't want to tangle with you. Tech's as right as rain, Brady, so remember it. Now let's take a case where an owner might report poor idle along with poor economy. If you get those two conditions together, better start looking at the power enrichment system. You might find the mixture's too rich and you can't correct it by adjusting the idle adjusting needles and idle airspeed screw. Chances are the power valve diaphragm is ruptured and will have to be replaced. You replace the power valve as an assembly and when you install the new valve, be sure the gasket is positioned properly. It has a slip fit on the valve that's mighty important to overall carburetor operation. I get the message, Chad. Okay. Good. Now, if an owner reports a flat spot or hesitation on acceleration... Test the accelerating pump system, right? Yep. And you do the same as you've done before, Brady. Oh, open and close the throttle lever and look for the squirts of fuel from the nozzles. Right. If there is little or no discharge of fuel, there might be an improper pump override adjustment. Some foreign matter in the discharge passages or nozzles. You'll find details on that override adjustment, along with all the carburetor service that applies, outlined in the reference book. So give the book more than a lick and a promise reading. Don't you worry, Chad. I'll study it over, but good. Do that, Brady, and then you'll have smooth sailing whenever a Holly carburetor needs attention. Our owners, too, will appreciate your trouble-free service. <laughs>